This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dwight and I um, found out that our alma mater, Elon, lost to Towson last night. Which is really, yeah, you guys are happy. I actually don't really care, but Dwight's a little bit sad. But it reminded me as I was reading this passage this morning with the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Jebusites, we had an Old Testament professor who would go through the whole list of all the ites and then he'd add in the, the bed bugs that bite and other ones that he would make up just to make sure that you were listening during class. I didn't do that, so you can be grateful. You know, as a pastor, I get a lot of questions, a lot of questions. I get questions about God, questions about politics, questions about the church. Occasionally, I get questions about medical things, I guess maybe because people think I've been on a lot of hospital visits and know things, which I don't. I get lots of really fun questions from kids. But I can tell you that, hands down, the two questions that I get most asked are these. Number one, why is there suffering in the world if God loves us? And number two, why is the God in the Old Testament angry and mean and violent, and God in the New Testament so loving? Now, I get them asked in lots of different formats with lots of different words, but all of them come down to those two ideas. What do we do with suffering in a world where God loves us, and with violence in a scripture that also teaches us that God is merciful and full of grace? We're on week four of our sermon series, Reading the Bible for All It's Worth, trying to give you a good idea of what's in the Bible and what's not, about how it was written. We've talked about the authors and the timing of different pieces. We've talked about the themes in the Old and New Testament. We've talked about the different genres found within the one book and a general history of how it all came to be put together in a canon. Last week, we kind of zoomed back a little bit and talked about how we read the Bible. Do we read it literally word for word like a science or history textbook? What does it mean that it's inspired or sacred? And if you missed any of these, I invite you to go back to our website and check them out, epworthalive.com. You can either watch the whole worship service that you've missed, or you can watch just the sermon portion to kind of catch you up on the series. Now, originally, we'd scheduled to talk about both suffering and the violence in the Old Testament in one sermon. But as I was writing and reading and studying and praying this week, I decided it was really too much for one sermon. We would be here for another two hours. So we're going to focus on just one aspect of this, answering the second of the two most asked questions. What do we do with all the violence in the Bible when we believe that God is loving? And then we'll, we'll put the suffering question in in a, in a future sermon. So, most of the violence that you find in the Old Testament can be boiled down into three categories. The first is crimes for which God prescribes the death penalty. So that includes texts like Exodus 22:20, 20, where it says that those who make sacrifices to another God other than Yahweh must be put to death. Or Exodus 21, 15 and 17, a child who hits or curses his parents deserves the death penalty. Or Exodus 35, 2, that says working on Sabbath deserves the death penalty. All of us would be in a lot of trouble. The second category includes texts that talk about God's anger and wrath and punishing his people when his anger burns against them. And we could look at Numbers 12 as an example for this. Miriam and Aaron, Moses' brother and sister, begin to grumble and gossip about him because he's married a Cushite wife and not an Israelite. And they say things like, why does God speak only to him? What's so special about Moses? And the scripture says the anger of the Lord burns against them and Miriam's skin becomes leprous. Now, this text has a whole lot of issues. We could do a whole sermon on why Miriam gets punished and not Aaron, but we're not going to go there today. Another example we find in Exodus 32, right after the Israelites have made the golden calf and begun to worship it instead of God, Moses comes down from the mountain and he finds it and the text tells us that God is angry. So Moses calls out to all of Israel and says to them, who is on God's side? Come and stand with me. And it says that the sons of Levi, and only the sons of Levi, run to him. And so then Moses commands them, saying this, 
Then he said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, you have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you. Can you imagine strapping on a sword and killing your brother and friend and neighbor for God? The third set of texts of violence in the Old Testament is where our um, second scripture passage comes from. And that's God commanding the Israelites to commit genocide. Canaan was a land populated with small city-states or kingdoms made up of various ethnic groups that all spoke similar languages. God had promised Israel that he would give them this land, the promised land flowing with milk and honey. But in order for that to happen, the people already inhabiting the land, the Canaanites and Jebusites and Hittites and bedbugs that bite, had to be conquered. And by conquering, God didn't just mean forcing them to relocate to another place. God instructs the Israelites to kill every man, woman, and child in that town. In fact, there's one text where he tells them even to to kill all of the animals in the town. So what do we do with these passages? How do we reconcile God's mercy and grace in Jesus with the God who assigns death penalty for what seems like minor infractions? Or how do we reconcile the wrath sent to those who displeased God with the God of compassion and justice that we find in the New Testament? Do we believe that God really instructed the Israelites to massacre other nations? Especially when we remember that the reason God sends the flood earlier on in Exodus, right at the beginning of Scripture, is because God was grieved to the heart, is what Scripture says. He was grieved to the heart by the violence men were afflicting upon one another. So how do we reconcile that God, the one who's grieved to the heart because of violence, with the one who instructs the Israelites to massacre even the animals in a Canaanite town? Well, as I see it, we have two options. If you read scripture literally, you have to accept that these commands and stories are a true and accurate depiction of what God said and did and commanded his people to do. Now, people who hold to this view, in order to explain how God's character is harsh and violent in one part of scripture and opposite in the other part of scripture, usually say that God needed to present a firm hand to the Israelites in order to lead them to walk in his path, away from the paths of the other religious cults around them. That God has the authority to give and take will at life, and that that is what we need to remember when we read these texts. They point to the Canaanites' wickedness, saying that they are more wicked than others and that they deserved extermination. Now, I personally have a hard time following that logic because for me, it doesn't reconcile the character of God that I see lived out in Jesus, the one who breaks bread with sinners and ministers to prostitutes and adulterers, the one who, even as he's being killed on the cross, speaks words of forgiveness to those actively killing, cursing, and beating him. It doesn't make sense to me. So what are our other options for understanding these texts? Well, to explain that, I have to once again go back to last week's sermon, because understanding these texts, I think, all depends on what you believe we mean when we say that these texts are sacred and inspired. If you believe that they are basically the dictated words of God, then you have to believe like the first group. But if, on the other hand, we can see and remember that these are words written by a people in a very specific time and context, shaped by the world and culture in which they lived, with their own purposes in mind as they wrote them, then we begin to see a different picture. In this case, we can see that really the biblical authors are representing what they believed about God, their own understanding of the way that God worked in their world than what God actually inspired them to say. Remember last week we talked about how scripture is God's word with a, a small w, inspired and sacred and given to us for a purpose, but Jesus is the word, James Earl Jones voice, all capital words, the word. 
We also have to compare the, we always have to compare the words of scripture with the word. When we do so, we see that these passages go against not only the great commandments that Jesus gives, but the very life and ministry of Jesus, who was God's unmitigated in flesh word for us. When we read these violent passages, it is easy for us to say that they lived in a less sophisticated world than we do. But the truth is that that impulse to kill, to destroy and seek vengeance against the enemy, to put to death those who violate our social norms is still a part of our world today. Throughout time and into the future, many different groups of people have perpetrated violence and will perpetrate violence, claiming God's blessing and command. This violent sickness is, of course, equal opportunity, right? Every religious group throughout time has done it in some way or another. And there have even been atheistic regimes who sought to impose their own worldview of utopia on people by slaughtering them. It happens now, and it certainly happened then. So what appears to us in scripture as being God-ordained, commanded, and blessed could certainly be their own written justification for what they did. So one way to reconcile the moral and theological dilemmas raised in these texts is to see Moses and Joshua and David and others as warriors living in a time when violence was understood as part of the way that God accomplished God's purposes. And the people around them attributed their violence to their gods as well. The Israelites attributed to God words and commands and deeds that they believed God would have authorized or done. So again, what I'm suggesting is that the Old Testament passages about violence and war really tell us more about the people and time and culture they were living in, more about their understanding and beliefs about the way God worked in the world than about the God in whose name they claimed authority. Reverend Adam Hamilton, whose um, book, Making Sense of the Bible is one of our sources for this series, suggests another way of understanding that. And that is to think about Moses and Joshua and David as Israel's heroes, as warrior saints is the term that he used. The stories written about them were ones that were written down long after their time in order to inspire others to courage and absolute commitment to God. He uses the analogy of William Wallace. You know who William Wallace is a little bit? He was a hero to Scotland, and he uses him as an example. Has anybody seen the movie Braveheart? We couldn't show that in church, so there's no clip like last week. For those of you who don't know, William Wallace is a legendary Scottish hero who died in 1305 after fighting the English for Scottish independence. Every Scottish child can tell you about William Wallace. Memorials to him can be found all over their country. Sir Walter Scott made the legend about William Wallace even bigger in his writings. Now, in England, he's criticized for killing civilians, but in Scotland, he is a hero. So maybe Moses and Joshua and David are like that for the Israelites. Stories written about them were meant to demonstrate courage, resolve, and faith, and to inspire later generations struggling against their own enemies. They were stories written from the theological perspective of the ancient Near East, where gods every day sent heroes into battle and fought alongside them. So if all of that is true, then what do we do when we read stories like this from Deuteronomy and call them the word of God? What is the value? What do we learn from these parts of scripture? I think one of the most important reasons we have to read it is to remind us of how easy it is for people of faith to invoke God's name in pursuit of violence and bloodshed and war. After all, the Crusaders marched into battle in Jerusalem in the name of Christ. Colonists from the old world came to the new with Bible and weapon in hand to claim America for Christ. Nazi belt buckles proclaimed God is with us on them even as they sought to exterminate millions of people. Christian nations have often gone to war and and invoked God in their efforts. So it shouldn't surprise us that people who lived 3,500 years ago also invoked God as they marched to war. 
If we do what I suggested a few minutes ago and judge all of the other words of Scripture in light of God's definitive word, Jesus Christ, we remember that Jesus taught us to love our neighbors, to turn the other cheek, to forgive those who've wronged us, and to pray for those who persecute us. This word stands directly in opposition to slaughter in the name of God. And it's these words that we should seek to pattern our lives around always on the lookout for ways that we are claiming God's authority where it's not, places where we are seeking to uh, have God bless the things that he isn't blessing, and instead seek freedom from the violent dimension of our human condition. This morning we have welcomed a new one into our church family, and if we have prepared to welcome more through the act of confirmation. We have promised to teach all of them about God, to remind them always of God's love and the church's love for them. As they grow into their faith, their understanding of God will change. Baxter will know God in different ways when he's 30 than he will when he's five. That's true for all of us. And that's true of the writers of scripture too. But we also have something that doesn't change, the Word, Jesus the Christ. And we have a way to remember and reset our minds back on the things that are of Him. Today we celebrate baptism, that which reminds us of God's love for us even before we know it, and communion, the sacrament that reminds us of the work that God did for us through Jesus Christ. So now, friends, let us turn our heart to God, to the word of Christ, as we celebrate and remember together. You can follow along.